Journey to the West East is East and West is West is a primitive idea. Modern man has reached the moon. The West is advanced in technology and the East in spirituality. Why not build a bridge of understanding? That the West has much to share with the East is beyond doubt. But the East also has something to contribute to the West. The flower of the West, without the fragrance of the East, is a flower in vain. A Doctor's Recurring Vision There was a psychiatrist from a small town in Germany. People often called him a crazy doctor because he did not believe much in modern medicine. He was more inclined to search for esoteric knowledge. In 1955, he had a recurring vision of my master. He felt that the man who was appearing in his visions was calling him to come to India. The same vision occurred again and again for seven days. So he went to Frankfurt and bought an airplane ticket for India. But while waiting for his flight, he fell asleep in the airport lounge and missed his plane. Shortly before that, my master asked me to go to Germany to learn something about Western psychology and philosophy. A businessman from Bombay managed to get my ticket to Frankfurt and gave me a few letters of introduction to his friends there. With further instructions from my master, whom I adored as my Guru Deva, I left for Germany. When I arrived in Frankfurt, the doctor was at the airport. When he saw that I was a Swami from India, he approached me and showed me several drawings he had made of the person in his recurring vision. He asked me if I knew of any such man in India. The first thing he said to me was, Please help me. The man in this drawing has appeared to me in a vision again and again. I have tried to draw the picture of my visions as well as I could. I'm sure it is not a hallucination. This vision has created such deep grooves in my mind that I cannot do my work. All that I can think of is this image. You are a Swami from India. Perhaps you can help. When I saw the drawings, I said, He is my master. He insisted that I go back to India with him and take him to my master. But my master did not want me to return right away. He thought that I was attached to his mortal being and wanted to break the mortal ties to strengthen my awareness of the immortal link between us. He wanted me to remain physically away from him for some time and to become aware of the more subtle bond which exists between us. That's why he sent me to different teachers in different parts of the Himalayas. I gave the doctor a long letter to show Dr. Chandrahar and Dr. Mitra of Kanpur, India. In the letter, I asked them to lead him to Jageshwar, where my master was camping next to the temple and teaching Professor Nixon, that's Krishnan Prem, and Dr. Alexander, that's Anand Bhikkhu. With the help of the doctors of Kanpur, the German doctor met my master, stayed with him for three days, and then returned to Germany. He then arranged for me to visit different institutes and universities throughout Europe. I met with many great Western doctors and psychologists. After visiting several European countries and studying in many institutions and universities, I returned to India. 
Some time later, this doctor again left for India, where he became a sannyasi, meaning renunciate. He now devotes his time to meditation in a small thatched hut in the northeastern Himalayas. Some Westerners call him crazy because he prefers to live in isolation. I have met a few foreigners like him who have become swamis, and I have found them to be more serious than many of the Indian swamis. A prophetic vision is the rarest of all visions. It flashes from the source of intuition and is therefore beyond the concept of time, space and causation. Such a vision sometimes is received by laymen accidentally. But those who do meditation and have truly attained the fourth state of mind receive such guiding visions consciously. This unalloyed vision always comes true. Transformation in the Cave For eleven months I lived in a small cave. For those eleven months, I never saw a single human being. In our tradition, this is an essential practice. Usually, it is not practiced for less than eleven months, because it is believed that even the most inert aspirant will realize the highest truth through this practice during that period. So the teacher says, no matter how able you are, I will assume you to be the most inert. You will have to complete eleven months in the solitude of the cave. You are not allowed to come out and take a bath, but you are taught a vigorous breathing practice such which cleans your pores and which is actually better than bathing. You get a very limited amount of food once a day and some water but that is quite sufficient to maintain life. My food was mostly barley and mountain vegetables, some juices, a glass of milk in the morning and one in the evening. In the limited space of the cave, which was six feet by six feet, I would do a few postures regularly and would sleep for two or three hours only. The rest of the time I remembered my Guru Mantra and meditated or gazed. Three times a day I did pranayama vigorously but very cautiously. The entrance to the cave is closed but there is an outlet for the waste to wash away and a tiny needle point hole in the ceiling of the cave where a single shaft of light can enter. This tiny hole is to aid in the concentrating the mind on a single point. This happens spontaneously even if you don't want it to happen. You don't have to make any effort to concentrate in that situation because there is only one ray of light and nothing else. In such isolation, what will you do the whole day if you don't learn meditation? If you don't do meditation, you quickly become imbalanced. You have no choice. The sages systematically teach you the method of going deep into meditation. They say, this is the first step, the next, the third, and so on. They will describe certain symptoms that arise out of meditation. Then, when a particular symptom appears, you know you are going to the next step. In this way, you attain the highest degree of concentration. They keep a strict watch on you, so that you remain undisturbed and do not go through suffering of any sort. Dwelling in the cave for the first two months was very difficult for me, but later I started enjoying it immensely. The science of Raja Yoga teaches Samayama, inner transformation through concentration, meditation and Samadhi. During this training, 
I discovered that without living in silence for a considerable time, maintaining a deeper state of meditation is not possible. After eleven months I came out of the cave. It was five o'clock in the evening on July 27. I was asked not to stay outside in the sun for the first week. I had difficulty in adjusting to the external world. Everything looked different, as though I had come to a strange new world. The first time I went to the city, it took me forty minutes to cross a street corner because I was not accustomed to so much external activity. But gradually I became able to deal with the world. Coming back to the external world, I realized that the world is a theater where I could test my inner strength, speech, emotions, thoughts and behavior. After the completion of this training, I was prepared to come to the West. I did not want to leave my master, but he insisted. He said, you have a mission to complete and a message to deliver. That message is ours and you are my instrument. My master then instructed me to go to Japan. He told me that I would meet someone in Japan who would help me come to the United States. I left for Tokyo from Calcutta by plane with only eight dollars in my pocket. When we stopped in Hong Kong, I ordered tea in the airport restaurant and was surprised to be presented with a bill for four dollars. I left another dollar as a tip, so I arrived in Tokyo with only three dollars and an apple which I had saved from the meal aboard the airplane. A man came up to me and asked where I had come from and where I would be staying in Japan. I told him I have a friend and I will stay with him. He asked me, Who is your friend? I didn't know how to answer him since I didn't know anyone in Japan. So I said, You are that friend. I stayed with him and he introduced me to Yokadasan, the spiritual head of Mahikari. He has a following of several hundred thousand. Yokadasan has had many visions of a sage of the Himalayas. When I was introduced to him, he hugged me with reverence and said, I have been waiting for you. I hope you will give me the secret teachings of the Himalayan masters. I lived with him for six months and had occasion to address and teach various spiritual groups in Tokyo, Osaka and other cities. After I had imparted the message of my master to Yokodasan, he brought me a ticket and I continued my journey to the United States. Before I had left India, my master had told me that in the United States I would meet my students and associates. He described many details to me which have since come true. I have still to complete my task. This sometimes makes me pensive, but I know that when the Lord gives me the opportunity, I will fulfill the purpose of my life. My purpose is to create a bridge between the East and the West by establishing a center of learning from where I can faithfully deliver the message of the sages. Ways of East and West when I left the Himalayas to visit Japan and the United States, my master gave me a few instructions. I asked him, what shall I teach to the students who wish to learn from me? Shall I convert them and teach them the religions of India? Shall I ask them to follow the Indian culture? He said, you foolish boy. I said, then tell me. What shall I teach them? The culture in the West is entirely different from ours. 
Our culture does not allow one to get married to anyone without the consent of other family members. While the culture in the West believes in a free social circle, a Christian can get married to anyone, and the Jewish people do likewise. Of course, their ways of worshipping God are set in a fixed, particular style, while we worship the way we like and choose the path of enlightenment we want. We are free thinkers, but we are in the bondage of social laws, and they are in the bondage of certain fixed ideas in their way of thinking and worshipping. I asked, these two diverse ways of life seem to be quite apart. How can I deliver your message to the West? He said, Though these cultures live in the same world with the same purpose of life, they are each extreme. Both East and West are still doing experiments on the right ways of living. The message of the Himalayan masters is timeless and has nothing to do with the primitive concepts of East or West. Extremes will not help humanity to attain the higher step of civilization for which we all are striving. Inner strength, cheerfulness and selfless service are the basic principles of life. It is immaterial whether one lives in the East or West. A human being should be a human being first. A real human being is a member of the cosmos. Geographical boundaries have no powers to divide humanity. To get freedom from all fears is the first message of the Himalayan sages. The second message is to be aware of the reality within. Be spontaneous and let yourself become the instrument to teach pure spirituality without any religion or culture. All the spiritual practices should be verified scientifically if science has the capacity to do so. Let providence guide you. With reverence I made a bow and started for my journey. I came to the city of Kanpur where I stayed a few months with our disciple Dr. Sunanda Bai, who brought my air ticket to Japan. Our Tradition Shankaracharya established an ascetic order 1,200 years ago, though renunciates had already lived in an unbroken lineage from the Vedic period. He organized his orders through five main centers in the north, east, south, west and center of India. The entire ascetic order of India traces its tradition from one of these centers. Our tradition is Bharati. Bha means knowledge. Rati means lover. Bharati means he who is the lover of knowledge. From this comes the word Bharata, the land of spiritual knowledge, one of the Sanskrit names used for India. There is one thing unique to our tradition. It links itself to an unbroken lineage of sages even beyond Shankara. Our Himalayan tradition, though a tradition of Shankara, is purely ascetic and is practiced in the Himalayan caves rather than being related with institutions established in the plains of India. In our tradition, learning of the Upanishads is very important, along with special advanced spiritual practices taught by the sages. The Mandukya Upanishad is accepted as one of the authoritative scriptures. The knowledge of Sri Vidya imparted stage by stage and the advanced student is taught Prayoga Shastra, which explains the practicality and application of the discipline one has to follow for this knowledge. 
we believe in both the mother and the father principles of the universe. That which is called Maya or illusion in our worship becomes the mother and does not remain as a stumbling block or obstacle on the path of spiritual enlightenment. All of our worship is internal and we do not perform any rituals. There are three stages of initiation given according to our tradition. First, mantra, breath awareness and meditation. Second, inner worship of Sri Vidya and Bindu Bhedana which is piercing the pearl of wisdom. The third, Shakti Pata, and leading the force of Kundalini to the thousand petaled lotus called the Sahasrara Chakra. At this stage, we do not associate ourselves with any particular religion, caste, sex, or color. Such yogis are called masters and are allowed to impart the traditional knowledge. We strictly follow the discipline of the sages. It is not possible for me to discuss in detail the secret teachings of Prayoga Shastra, for it is said, Na Dattavyam, Na Dattavyam, Na Dattavyam. Don't impart, don't impart, don't impart, unless someone is fully prepared and committed and has practiced self-control to a high degree. These attainments can be verified through the experiences of the sages of the past. In our path, Guru Deva is not a god, but a bright being who has faithfully and sincerely attained a state of enlightenment. We believe in the grace of the Guru as the highest means for enlightenment, but never as the end. The purpose of the Guru is to selflessly help his disciples on the way to perfection. Our tradition has the following orientation. 1. One absolute without a second is our philosophy. 2. Serving humanity through selflessness is an expression of love which one should follow through mind, action and speech. 3. The yoga system of Patanjali is a preliminary step accepted by us for the higher practices in our tradition, but philosophically we follow the Advaita system of one absolute without a second. 4. Meditation is systematized by stilling the body, having serene breath and controlling the mind. Breath awareness, control of the autonomic nervous system and learning to discipline primitive urges are practiced. 5. We teach the middle path to students in general and those who are prepared for higher steps of learning have the opportunity to learn the advanced practices. This helps people in general in their daily lives to live in the world and yet remain above. Our method for the convenience of Western students is called super conscious meditation. I am only a messenger delivering the wisdom of the Himalayan sages of this tradition and whatever spontaneously comes from the center of intuition that I teach. I never prepare my lectures or speeches, for I was told by my master not to do so. 6. We do not believe in conversion, changing cultural habits or introducing any God in particular. We respect all religions equally, loving all and excluding none. Neither do we oppose any temple, mosque or church, nor do we believe in building homes for God while ignoring human beings.
Our firm belief is that every human being is a living institution or temple. 7. Our members are all over the world and for the sake of communication we also believe in education. Our graduate program imparts the knowledge given by the sages thereby fulfilling the inner need of intellectuals. 8. We practice vegetarianism. We teach a nutritional diet that is healthy and good for longevity, but at the same time we are not rigid and do not force students to become vegetarians. 9. We respect the institution of the family and stress the education of children by introducing a self-training program and not forcing our beliefs, faiths and way of life on them. 10. Our trained teachers systematically impart all aspects of yoga relating to body, breath, mind and individual soul. Awareness within and without is key and the methods of expansion are carefully introduced to the students. 11. To serve humanity we believe in examining verifying and coming to certain conclusions regarding the yoga practices including relaxation and meditation. 12. Our experiments are documented and published for the benefit of humanity. We believe in universal brotherhood, loving all and excluding none. 14. We strictly abstain from politics and from opposing any religion. 15. Of great importance is the practice of non-violence with mind, action and speech. The knowledge that is imparted by the sages and masters of the Himalayas guides the aspirant like a light in the darkness. The purpose of this message is to awaken the divine flame that resides in the reservoir of every human being. This flame, when perfectly kindled by spiritual discipline, mounts higher and higher into the vast light of truth. It rises through the vital or nervous mind, passes through our mental sky, and finally enters the paradise of light, its own supreme home in the eternal truth. Then the illumined practitioner sits calm in his celestial sessions with the highest of powers and drinks the wine of infinite beatitude. This child of immortality is a child of universal parents, protected all the time by the mother divine. This rapturous child of bliss remains divine will intoxicated in delight. He becomes a sage, a sleepless envoy and ever wakeful guide for those who tread the path. Such a leader on the path marches in front of human people to comfort, help and enlighten them. Om Shanti Shanti, Shanti.